Alice Roberts, and I'm going to be reading to you one of my favorite stories. This one's called Anatole and the Robot. We see right here on the first page that this used to be a library book. This is where they would stamp the book in the library to tell you when to bring it back in. This book was last checked out in 1976. That's a long time ago. This must be a very old book. And we have here the French flag or the flag of France. It tells us that this book must be French. Anatole and the Robot by Eve Titus. Pictures or the drawings in here by Paul Galden. This book is for on the dedication page my son Richard and his cousins Ginny and Ginny and Marion and Michael and Martha and Bobby and Barry and Anne and Peter. In all of France, there was no better cheese taster than Anatole, who worked at the Duval factory in the darkness of night. Nobody saw him come and nobody saw him go. So nobody knew he was only a midget of a mouse. There he is, amongst the cheese. All went well with him until a robot appeared and, but it would be wiser to begin at the beginning. The affair began with the French measles. Naturally, it was not the robot who caught the measles, nor was it Anatole or his dear wife Doucette. Not, none of their six charming children caught it. Not Paul or Paulette or Claude or Claudette or George or Georgette. It was a man who caught it, Monsieur Duval, the factory president. One morning, Duval took a look in the looking glass. What he saw made him send for, an old, for old Dr. Prouliant who said, silly man, to catch the measles at your age, someone must take your place at the factory. Hop into bed. Duval obeyed. I shall ask my fifth cousin, La Rue, the inventor. Once upon a time, the fellow worked for me, so he knows cheese. And in 10 seconds, the two men were talking on the telephone. said Duval to La Rue. Duval here, alas, I have the measles. Please stop inventing inventions and run my factory for me. Our cheeses are the world's best, thanks to Anatole. Therefore, act like a very important person, but change nothing. I'll pay you well. Agreed? Said La Rue to Duval. Agreed, my good cousin. Adieu, and hung up quickly. Said Lurat to himself, scornfully, who cares about Anatole or Bananatol or whatever his name is? This is my chance to try out my remarkable invention, the robot with the cheese tasting machine in its chest. And when my cheese act starts tasting cheese, Bananatol, beware! Next day, with his feet upon the desk of Duval, LaRue dictated a memo for Anatole to the secretary of Duval. Almost in tears, she pleaded, do not send this memo, monsieur. He is our first vice president in charge of cheese tasting. LaRue took LaRue twirled his mustachios. Am I not president now? A president has charge of everything, including vice presidents. Type it and tack it to the tasting room door. Toot de sweet. 
Sighing, the poor girl did as she was told. And when Anatole arrived at midnight, there was the mouse. He was so shocked, he could barely squeak. From Maru, the inventor, to Anatole, about Jizak the robot. My cousin Duval has the measles, and I am now in charge of the factory. Map machines work faster, and they never make mistakes. So I've got given your job as taster to my robot. Duval is certain to prefer him to you. Look for another job. Gaston, who is Anatole's helper, spoke angrily. So, out of the cold, out in the cold, just like that, this makes, this is the thanks you get after all you've done for Duval? Mice, I trust, but men? Bah, twice, bah, twenty times, bah. Anatole at last found his tongue. Ah, do not blame Duval. Good he has always been. Good he will always be. To be robbed of my job by a robot. Believe me, it hurts. Still and all, Maru is the one in charge now. Obey him, I must, for I am not a mouse, for am I not a mouse of honor? Once Duval is recovered, we'll learn from him who is to be taster. Meanwhile, let's peek at, his, at this robot. I'm so, I'm as curious as a cat. And in a, and in a trice, the mice had slipped under the door. And a toll and gets done. LaRue sat sleeping in a chair, his feet up on the table. Cheezak, the robot, was splendid and shining to see. He was man-sized, made mostly of metal, with a big square face and a big square body and long mustachios like his master. The machines hidden inside him hummed softly as he marched quickly from table to table and each time he picked up a cheese, strange things happened. A little sliding door in the robot's chest slid open. Buzzes, buzzers buzzed, lights flashed, bells rang, bong. Out dropped a small printed sign. Cheezak caught the sign and stuck it in the cheese. He put the cheese down, slid his sliding door shut, and hurried to the next table. Bravo, cried Anatole admiringly. Now to climb up and see whether Cheezak really knows cheese. The little sign says, specially good. Men add exactly 22 and a half drops of white vinegar from Cheese the Robot. Tasting, Anatole said, we oui, it needs vinegar. But why 22 and a half drops? Are the men learning how to count or how to make cheese? My own signs are never so exact. I sniff, I taste, I think, and then I use the magic of my imagination can a robot do this? For that matter, could a man or his man-made robot ever be a better judge of cheese than a mouse? Never, cried Gaston. Besides, the robot rules, rushes much too much. Anatole nodded. No longer will the men sing for joy or work slowly and carefully to make the very best cheese. LaRue will speed them up like the robot. That mixed up man worries me. How can he sleep so soundly? Everybody knows that certain machines need watching. Clearly we have to come here every night to check up. Now let us leave. I must tell my wife 
the sad news. Happily, the news did not upset Doucette. She laughed and said, there is more cheese in the tip, there is more cheese sense in the tip of your tail than LaRue's big silly head. Duval will choose you. He kissed her brow. I am touched by your faith in me, Petite, but all play and no work may make me a dull mouse. I'm off to the library to read about robots. Au revoir. And read he did, book after book, for hours and hours. The sign in the library says, Silence, s'il vous plaît, as please in French. That night, Anatole and Gaston appeared at the factory. Cheesac was working. His master was again napping. Said Anatole, the cheeses could all turn into quacking ducks, and that lazy lump of, Le, of a LaRue would still slumber on. However, all's well here, so home we go, Gaston, and home they went. On the second night, things looked the same, and Anatole said the cheeses could all turn into gobbling turkeys, and that sleeping beauty of a LaRue would still snore on. However, all's well in here, so home we go, Gaston. And again, home they went. On the third night, riding down the, the Rue de la Caille, Anatole suddenly stopped and cried out in alarm. Something has gone wrong in the factory. How do I know? It is because I am the seventh son of a seventh son. Ride on, mon ami. Ride like the wind itself. And they raced towards the factory. Faster, ever faster. Anatole was right. Something was wrong. Cheesac never gave the men time to rest or to sing for joy. They told LaRue that the finest cheese was not made in a hurry. Over and over again they told him, but he simply said, speed up men, speed up. That day a sign said, add 99 grains of pepper. No more, no less. Such sneezing as went on, it could be heard a block away. Achoo, achoo, achoo! How the men wished for Anatole and his signs. But nobody had ever met him. Nobody knew where he lived. It was decided that it was time to act. At midnight, two men tiptoed past the sleeping LaRue, saying softly, Soon you shall send for Anatole. Quickly they pulled a lot of wires out of Chizak's chest, and they put all the wires back, but in the wrong places. This done, they tiptoed out, just as the mice tiptoed in. It was a dreadful sight to meet their, that met their eyes. Out of Cheezak's sliding door spilled springs and wires. He was hopping and skipping and clickety-clanking sounds and throwing cheese wildly around the room. There was cheese on the walls, cheese on the floor, and cheese dripping down from the ceiling. That with splushes and splashes and clinkings and clankings, LaRue awoke and began to tremble like a leaf. Suddenly, Chizak turned and marched straight towards his master, holding out his huge arms as though to hug him. Closer and closer he came, and LaRue shut his eyes, screaming. A bear hugs hard, 
but a robot hugs harder. Somebody save me! Gaston was frightened. Once this Jizak steps upon us, we'll be squashed as flat as crepes, Suzette. Run, Anatole, there is danger. But Anatole did run, right towards the robot, up the mountain of metal, climbed the tiny daredevil, up past the long legs, past the huge hips, past the square shoulders and the broad brow, until he was standing on top of Chizak's head. Voila! If a mouse once saved a lion, then this mouse may save a man. And he pulled his paw and pulled out a plug. It's a fine, brave deed you have done, cried Gaston. My dear fellow, replied the modest mouse as he scurried down. It was a simple matter to unplug his thinking box for I had studied some books about robots. But look, LaRue is opening his eyes. I wonder what he will do now. The first thing the man did was to bump into the robot. Was it on purpose? Nobody knows. Not you, not I. But Chizak crashed to the floor and was smashed into pieces. So, that's the end of the robot, declared LaRue. But alas, it's not the end of the mess he's made. Only Bananatol could unmess the mess in time to save the factory. Since I sent him away, business has been none too good. Now, it will go from bad to worse to terrible. I wonder, was it he who saved me? How sorry I am for the way I treated him. The man staggered towards the door. Well, what's done is done. To prove I am a changed man, I will work here a whole year without pay, learning the business from the ground up. And he left moaning. Oh, why did I do what I did? No sooner did the door close than the two friends went to work. They scrubbed and swept and mopped till the mess was all unmessed. The Anatole did what he loved to do. He sniffed and tasted and pinned his signs on to the cheese. When the black, when the back of night faded into day, the job was done. Before leaving, Anatole scribbled a special sign for LaRue. Also, he made a bundle of some of the robots' odds and ends, for he thought of a wonderful use for them at home. The sign says, especially good, all is forgiven, but it was not Bananatol who saved you. It was Anatol. When Monsieur Duval returned, he said to the men, I pardon you all, even LaRue, who I have appointed fifth vice president in charge of sweeping up scraps. He wishes to learn the business from the ground up. And with Anatol back, Business is once again ooh la la. And the men tossed their berets in the air, shouting, Vive Anatole, the world's champion cheese taster. While Duval spoke, Anatole also spoke in the village square, where a great crowd heard him tell the tale of the robot. When he had finished, the mice clapped until their paws hurt. Woo, woo. Then Gaston leaped to the platform and cried, Our hero saved a man. Therefore, let no man ever lay a trap for Anatole the Mouse Magnifique. Doucette's lace handkerchief was wet with happy tears 
time there was then there were no prouder children anywhere than Paul and Paulette and Claude and Claudette and George and Georgette. As for the robot's odds and ends, Anatole worked secretly in his workshop, making a surprise for his wife. And thus it was that Doucette became the only mouse wife in all of France who never had to wash her own windows. A midget of a robot did them for her. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Bye for now.